Welcome to Factorio Masterclass. My name is Nilos and this is the series of tutorials and guides here on YouTube covering all aspects of the game and aims to provide insights and resources to help you improve as an engineer. In this episode, we are going to cover what we can say, um, what I've just said above, like all aspects. And this is one of the more meta aspects. We're going to talk about the true killer, the true enemy of mega basing, the performance. Because at some point, you just won't be able to build anymore, build the base bigger because you just run out of computing power. The inspiration and input for these masterclass videos, they usually come from the dialogue and the experience we have over on Twitch. And this is a this is where I stream live every evening, pretty much every evening at Twitch TV slash Nilos and it's at 8 p.m. Central European time. And you're very welcome to drop by and help design and decide and yell at me in real time. If you have uh, ideas for future videos, then uh, let me know in the comment section below or join the Discord and let me know there, or maybe uh, join the live streams and uh, we can engage in a dialogue there. Now, how do we get into a topic, a monstrous topic such as performance? This is something that uh, if, if for many people, this will be completely irrelevant because you won't be able to, uh, or you won't be building a base that is gonna drag down your PC, but maybe you have, an older system and uh, you want to build big or you have top of the line that you want to build really big and then you get into these troubles and uh, this, this is why i make this tutorial which is a bit of a meta tutorial because it deals with some weird things but i think it's very important because when i build bases they tend to be big and i get a lot of questions from people go like why do you do this and this doesn't seem efficient and it's like, yeah, I know, but I have to do it this way because I want to build big. And that means I have to do some things inefficient in order to optimize for performance later on. So this uh, video will include basically definition of, uh, of the terms and how you can measure this, talk about what is good in terms of uh, specs and then talk about how uh, what is bad for updates and uh, what's bad for performance. And then of course, I'm going to go in and talk about how you design around uh, the performance in your base for the future. So that you get some practical advice that you can use for your own bases. Let's start with the very basics. What is it actually when we talk about performance? Well, you can see in the top right hand corner here, I have listed my FPS frames per second and UPS updates per second. Those are the key metrics when it comes to performance. As long as they're 60, 60, you're happy. Now let's uh, just highlight how I get them up there. Press F4 for the debug menu and then show FPS always under the always tab. That is super important uh, for us to do. I always have it on because I kind of like knowing if there's, if there's an issue. Now let's explain each of those terms here. The FPS is the frames per second. That is uh, if the frames drop below the updates, then that is, and you're running locally, then it's because your PC is not able to generate all of the graphics that is needed to calculate. This is extremely unlikely, I would say, but it could happen if you have lots of, I don't know, smokes, particles, that kind of thing, uh, clouds on top. Those are, as you can see in this space, I don't have smoke, I don't have particles, I don't have decorations. That's also because it just takes calculations that I don't want to waste. Also, it's bad for for YouTube and Twitch compression. So no more sort of, no unnecessary distractions on the screen. The updates per second is how fast the game calculates. The game wants to calculate 60 updates per second. And if it, uh, if it takes more than 16.67 milliseconds to calculate an update, then it cannot create 60 updates per second. And you can see this one's flickering, it's all good. If we press our F5 button, this opens up a debug menu and I'm gonna just uh, hover over so we have it in the black background. This is the key metric that you will be looking at. The update here, if this number goes above 16.67, then you will start seeing the updates go down. And this is our key way of indicating where we have issues. So this number is how long time it takes to generate a frame. And you can see the front number, that's the one you really want to uh, to highlight. The This is the highest number, the lowest number, but in a certain period, but it's, it shows spikes, but this is what you want. This is the one that has to be consistently. So this base is a 3000 science per minute base, not working 100% efficient, but that's how much it is. So it's a pretty big base. And uh, you can see the breakdown here on the game update. And that's where it actually breaks down. 
uh, break it down into game updates and scripting. Before we dive into this breakdown, let's actually talk a bit about the PC specs. So if you want to design, you buy your next PC in four factorial, or you want to know if it's a new graphic card or it's a new RAM or whatever it is that will make your performance better, then generally, Factorio is a primarily a single core process. There are things that are spread out, but it is the single core process that has to keep track of the consistency of all the calculations. For that reason, you want a fast CPU. It's better than many CPUs, like uh, therefore, I hear sometimes someone says, oh, just throw it on Amazon Web Service, and that is not good because they generally don't have high single core uh, single core speeds, but they have many cores, but since that doesn't scale out that, that way, it's not really very efficient. Plus you have all the other issues with noisy neighbors and can't really determine it. So the very best option you have is to run it on a PC with yeah top of the line, the best CPUs around. Also fast RAM is also uh, important because that's the how fast you can access the, the data. Aside from this, uh, the question is sometimes also is, should it, would it be better to have a server running it that you can then have a really powerful server and that will compensate for your maybe your slower pc and the answer is no because your pc will have to do all the same calculations as the server does then you need to be as fast as the server the server can be if you're playing with multiple people then of course the fastest one should be the server but if you're just playing yourself like i'm i'm doing when i play this game on my own pc which is an i7 then it performs way better than when I play on the server where the server is an i9. And that is because the server will be able to keep up. But my PC will not always keep up. But if I run it locally and my PC can't keep up, it'll just slowly dip and then it'll come back up and can come back up again. Or it'll just gradually slow down the game. But if the server is faster than the PC or the client, then you will simply get flooded with updates from the server that your client can't keep up. And then you'll get into some buffer situations where you're actually just lagging behind the server on updates. And if that gets too much, you'll actually be thrown off. So I would say if don't get a server for performance reasons, get a server for playing with friends, but don't get play with on a server for, uh, for thinking that it will be better for performance. It will not. Uh, also, the experience playing on a server that can keep up and your client cannot keep up is excruciating because you get these very, very visible latent uh, lags and breaks and sometimes you can't move while it's buffering. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend a server, uh, server play. But I mean, if you have other, uh, other, other experience, then let me know in the comments below. So what is a uh, good and bad updates? Uh, but for UPS, let's look at this menu again. We're going to scroll over here. So we have it on the background. This is the key part. So you have this game update. This is, has to be below 16.67 to keep running. And then we have it a breakdown here. You can see here the circuit networks, that's transport lines, that's belts, fluid manager, well, that's fluids, heat manager, that's the damn heat pipes of the nuclear power plants. Entity update, that's always the biggest one. It's gigantic. And that's unfortunately, I wish it was broken down, but that's all the other stuff like inserters, assemblers, uh, miners, uh, all those things that are not in any of the other categories. So I wish this one was broken down a bit more so we could see where is it actually? How much is inserters? How much is assemblers? I don't know. It, just a breakdown would be nice. Logistics manager and construction manager. That's for our robots. So you can see in this space, it's not much. Pathfinder is the biter pathfinder. So you will actually have a lot of, a lot of pathfinding when the biters are attacking you will see a ton of of pathfinding as it comes in and things can slow down we have trains and the train pathfinding so trains are also kind of a big contributor as well and you have some chart updates for the map but basically those are the main category that will always be there and then if you have mods and this is important there are some mods that will absolutely kill performance sometimes uh People would recommend a mod like Bottleneck. That's a really nice little indicator whether things are, are, are input output constraint, except that Bottleneck is disproportionately uh, hard on the impact on the performance compared to how small of a mod it is. So you want to be really careful when adding mods. Any mods that include a scripting will always have an impact here. I have a few, but they are very, very light. So I don't uh, have a problem with that. The next part is 
there will be some mods that will absolutely prevent you from making a big base, such as Advanced Autonomous Industry, AI, where you control vehicles in a more RTS manner. You just can't build big with that. It'll, it's simply too, too heavy on the scripting. And there will be tons of other mods. So do keep it in mind as you build new bases, build different mods, uh, add no mods, they will have an impact here. And you can always see that with your F5 debug menu. Now, the more interesting thing is how do we design for performance? Because that is something that's way more interesting. Now we kind of know what the, how to measure it, what are the contributing factors. So let's go through each of the different things that contribute to it. But also let's talk about how to keep things in mind. So one of the things that uh, the, the first we saw here on the side was circuit network. Let's start with that one, circuit network. In this case, it hovers around, let's say, 0.5 to 0.8, it's something. It's actually more than I like. And the reason is that I do have some circuit networks in the base. You can see uh, this alert thing is what I have. And if you want to follow this base, then it's over on Twitch, or you can also here on YouTube find it and my recap for the Factory launch series. I have these uh, notifications that are just continually monitoring what's going on in the logistic network in each of these blocks here and then outputting a signal. So we do have that, but I don't have a lot of other ones. And a lot of uh, people have been, during the play of this, have been suggesting that I do balanced unloading. You can see how awful the unloading is here, but do like uh, what, is, what is called the Matsuri loader. Basically, you make sure that uh, trains unload or load uh, sort of in a balanced way, but I can't do that. I've done it in one of my bases and it absolutely killed performance. So you have to be careful that if you make some very advanced uh, advanced circuit network, such as if you want to do a vanilla controlled, uh, vanilla controlled train network, that is very, very heavy on circuit networks. And if you do that, then you know that it's gonna be a contributing factor to limit the size of your overall base. So keep that in mind and only use it when necessary. Of course, I have things such as my circuit network down here, but I feel that this is very small. The main part is if you have every single loading, train loading and train unloading full of circuit networks that calculate 60 times a second, it's bad. So keep it in mind. Also like dashboards and such, they're also gathering a lot of data, calculating a lot because everything updates every 60, uh, 60 times a second. Now moving on to the next part, if we look at the overlay here, I'm just going to go out here, uh, is the transport lines. Transport lines in this base is extremely small. It's very common in many bases to have this maybe two or three. And that part, that is a very, very deliberate design uh, setup for that I've done. You will only see belts in my starter base here and they are all full. So the way it works is that full belts are great. Full belts are excellent and uh, and how do we, how do we, so for example, this, this is a pretty efficient build because it takes full belts in and it gets full belts out. That means for the majority of whatever is going on, you will have full belts everywhere. I want to show you how the belts are performing and we do that by going in here to debug menu and then there is a show transport line gap there. And we should have a train coming out. Now I'm visualizing every time there is a gap as long as these are full, then it's just treated as one entity from the calculation perspective. But as soon as they're not full, you can see all these little white lines, then it splits up the, the calculation. And now this is way more entities the game have to keep track of because the belts are no longer full. So try to keep full belts. And one of the places where you will have tons and tons of not full belt is out there on the mines. And this one is extremely more intensive calculation wise than keeping the belts full. So let's take that one out. Take out again. It is bears mentioning. Also, so out to save takes a bit of time now. Good. So that means if you want to make designs, make sure that you consolidate designs to full belts, such as, for example, I have this one full belts coming into green circuits, full green circuit belts coming out of green circuits. It's designed to deliver eight full belts output. Likewise, also here. The, each of these lines only generate 15, 15 uh, red circuits per second. But if I design it in a way that I get three of these, then I can have full belts. Even when there is a full demand on this, the belts will be full from here on 
and outwards. So always try to design things so that you have full uh, in, full belt input, full belt output, if at all possible. It's much more efficient. If you do that, belts are actually a really efficient way to uh, to transport materials. Not as good as trains, but pretty good. The next big thing is, if you look at the map again, over in here, you have something called Fluid Manager and Heat Manager. They are not very big actually at this point, but they are there and also just entities in general. So this is where nuclear power comes in. Nuclear power is here. And what you need to do is all of these, they're always calculating. They're always balancing. Every single one of these is balancing the heat between everything that's around it. And they will then calculate it. And this happens 60 times per second. So that's a absolute ton of calculations to maintain a nuclear power plant. Likewise, all of this, you can see that just the fact that it, it changes means that there is a calculation all the time about the flow in and out. For that reason, if you want to build really big nuclear power, just isn't the option anymore. It's it's kind of sad that that you can't use beautiful nuclear power, but this is, it's too much fluid calculation. It's too much uh, heat calculation. And this is uh, one of the reasons why you don't ever, ever, ever make steam storage. Don't even go there. Store your power. Store your power in the form of of these ones. They don't take any calculations. But if you calculate it as steam, it takes calculations 60 times a second. And you're destroying your base performance. So, if anyone builds a mega base and puts steam storage, you're doing it wrong. There. I could not be more clear about it. If you make a small base, who cares? But still, power should be stored in uranium fuel cells, not as steam. So that means, as you can see, you need to build a lot of, of solar panels. And you'd think that, really? You think that 372,000 solar panels and 311,000 accumulators is better than a thousand? Yes, they are. Because the, the way that solar panels actually work is that this, and accumulators as well, they act as one entity. If we go over here and look at them, they will all be synchronized. Well, it's the middle of the night time, but all the accumulators will charge and discharge at exactly the same rate, which means that from the game perspective, there's just one accumulator and there's one solar panel because they're synchronized. It's not like there's different efficiencies at different locations. So this is a, this is super important. So that's why I have 372,000 solar panels and I don't have enough power in the space. So I can't even, even take this out, even if I wanted to. I want to, but if I do it, I'm gonna have some turning off in the night and that's not great. So that's a big takeaway. You can build nuclear power for to a certain extent, but as you start topping up on the updates, the frames, the frames and updates, you have to get rid of it. And building 400,000 solar panels in immediately is something, it's a big thing. So you have to get started early and just continually expand your solar power. And that's what I've been doing for the last, I don't know, 100 hours in this space, just adding more solar all the time, everywhere I can. The next thing I want to talk about is biters. If we start by looking at here, it's over by the path pathfinding. I also believe the CRC, the cleanup thing, is also related to biters. And right now, biters are not that big of a deal. But let's uh, use our artillery train that I have conveniently parked up here and just start spamming out here. Uh, just trying to aggro as many biters as we can. Maybe there's someone out there as well. Yep, I, I think that should be it. And for anyone who wonders why I can do that, it's because I've unbound the drag map. I, I'd have to hold shift to drag the map. And if you unbound that, then you can actually do this. So right now, the point here is just aggro all the biters we can find and then they will start going in this has actually been been improved quite radically oh, this looks great uh, quite radically lately so that if they don't really find a good like pathing in then then you're actually um, yeah if they, if they don't find a good path to your base then they actually just give up and despawn which is really nice it seems that way at least you can already see our performance is dropping quite uh, quite a lot. I'm just going to go down here to see where it is. Uh, pathfinding is starting to go up. Well, not really. Chart update was kind of the map. So we really want to make sure that we 
get some of those biters in in an attack formation. Is this uh, this train? This this has been doing great. This train, but it's almost out. I really want to see that we can actually get some biters to attack us, and that will be that'll be how they. I see it. Yeah, there we go. There's a that's a lot of of biters, and you can see that our frames are just it's tanking. We we can't keep up anymore. Uh, there. Game update. Entity update is the same. We're getting more on the pathfinding. It's taking a lot more. And the chart update is taking more. So this is what happens when you have lots of biters. And at some point at the late game, biters don't really mean a damn thing. They, they are trivial. They are irrelevant. And you really just want to get rid of it. So there are three things I would recommend to do at this late game. Because biters don't mean a damn thing is that you will be first preventing them from spawning. That is a command. I will provide these commands, link in the description below. Then I will kill all worms, biters, and walking units. All of them. Boom. They're dead. And then I will also disable pollution because there's really no point in having pollution if you don't have biters. Because that's the only point of having pollution is to aggro the biters. So now we don't have any biters, we don't have any... Uh, of course you can't see that they had, they're not there, but if we are... Uh, do we still have a few shots? We still have a few shots left. So if we just go up here, we can we will be able to see that they are no longer. This, is, this of course will disable your achievement, but by this time you will have even the 20 million circuit uh, achievement. So you can see here, uh, anywhere they go, any chunk they revisit will just show that there is nothing there anymore. And our updates are now nice and happy. Uh, pathfinding is 0 0.001. I don't think it's probably just checking. Is there anything? Nope. So that's uh, that's something I would highly recommend. At some point, you just delete the biters, delete the pollution, and move on with your life. Next one, trains. Trains is a big one as well. Uh, trains, and uh, you can see here, let's actually start by looking at the performance here. Uh, I have there. It takes almost one update to calculate the trains. And for reference, I have 275 trains in this space. They're all 1-4 trains. It's of course a contributing factor. But remember, trains are extremely efficient. So don't limit your trains if you have to build it with robots or belts in a way. Trains are the best. Trains best mode of transport. That's, that's the way. But if you have to build it, then you also have to be careful because at this point, I'm seeing that 275 trains is kind of a lot. It's a big base, but it's still kind of a lot. It's the way that I've designed it with these small clusters. It's also a performance consideration. Then you you want to, it, it does add up at some point. So fewer trains and bigger trains are obviously better, but then you have to counter that with how are you going to manage those? It makes the design of your train network more complicated but it will be better for performance. So it's a trade-off, and uh, that's the trade-off you have to decide in your base. The giant trains, well, how are you gonna load them? You're probably gonna load them either with lots and lots of robots or lots and lots of belts. Either way, that's that's uh, that's gonna cost you something in performance as well. Speaking of the next thing, robots. If you look at my uh, overlay here, you can see, uh, that's a boring one. There's one, this is more like it. This is the way I've, I've designed this base. It's very heavily robot-based, every single one of these units here. Uh, this is producing 200 science of all but the space science every minute. So this is building, coming in with trains, unloading, and service by by robots. I have 1,500 robots here, and they are, maybe some of them I have 2,000. Yeah, 2,000. So it's about 1,500 that's in the air at any given time if the thing's busy. And then when a train comes in, this is a not great train to show as an example. But then we have the remaining robots just moving it out both into here and also the rest into locations. Uh, let's look at some of the other ones. These are just waiting for, to be able to unload. Uh, but tr robots are very efficient. So in this space, I have about 50,000 robots active. And if you look at the how much they take, logistics manager, that's mainly logistic robots. I think about 40,000 logistics robots. And it takes 0 0.6 updates. So you can you can kind of go crazy, but of course, like anything, if you scale up to like 200,000 robots, 
of course that will have an impact um, and that's probably some other way you could do that so it's always a matter of when you're using belts and belts you build it for distribution on short term or, or short distance and when you can keep the belts full like so when the belts are full they are happy keep them full as much as possible trains are of course for longer distance and super efficient for things that have lots and lots of, of different locations they go to make the robots imagine how many belts it would have to feed this that's just really impractical and that's why i went with robots here so just throw robots at the problem it solves it instead of doing anything else so that's a that's a good one of course we have sort of minor contributors like a bigger map is going to let's see <clears throat> bigger map keeping it alive keeping radars in the bigger map it's of course taking something <clears throat> but it's a very small thing and it's definitely not a thing that i would want to optimize electric network is another thing but i mean i don't know how i would optimize the electric network definitely not with power switches don't even go there another thing that's super important is uh, i have in some of my tips and tricks videos proposed to use some of these debug functions you know here these settings should be should be used only for debugging and bug reports they can cause game issues and performance issues and we're talking all about performance so if i show logistics robots on map i also really like doing recipes on map i also really like to show uh, signal states on map real signal states that one i love this one but now now actually yeah okay so when we scroll out here you can see the it's 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 tanking and this is actually not a calculation right you can see here the updates they're, they're fine they can keep up but i am unable to keep up on the drawing thought drawing part it simply takes too much to draw it i think that's behind the, this overlay uh, the sleep here is how much time the graphics part is keeping uh, is is idle between updates so let's take those out we don't want signal states that's actually one of the worst ones and they open there and then we should be coming back up to something better so you can see we go back to 60 and when we enable them it just tanks again so yeah do have to disable that also similarly all of these overlays there there you can see how much it affects the drawing uh, so don't use those if you don't need them go out take a look at the robot confirm that they are the way they are and then go back again so those are just some small notes about that there are a number of uh, of specific design criteria that i'm using and i would recommend if you want to build a big base and uh, and, and those are really the the key points that really make the biggest difference because the bigger difference is on the entity update that is the majority of the update of the performance comes from the optimizing the entity update so that's really what we what the core of it is but first i want to thank the patrons supporting the channel it means the world to me that there are people who want to support the work i do here and it's really the way that i can keep doing this on a full-time basis for you I do not have uh, at least not any sponsorships on the channel because I really appreciate the fact that I can run this as a community sponsored channel. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to everyone who is sponsoring the channel in that uh, through Patreon. If you want to support, there's of course no obligation, but if you want to, there's a link in the description below and Patreon is the best way to do that. Thank you very much. And let's dive back into the specific design things. Now, as, as I mentioned, entity update is by far the biggest one. Uh, where do we have it? There. It's way bigger than all the other ones, so you really want to design towards that. Fewer entities are obviously better. Entities that is primarily in terms of furnaces, inserters, um, assemblers, uh, miners, that kind of thing. It's not the transport belt, that's in a different category. Uh, in, it's beacons as well, but beacons are extremely, extremely light on updates. So a lot of uh, people, uh, this is really a beginner thing. It's like asking, why do you use beacons? It takes so much power, but you can just build more. No, if you use beacons, you have fewer entities. Fewer entities means you can build bigger. So you absolutely want to build big beacon builds. If you want to go absolutely crazy, then you build 12 beacon builds. But I think they're they're not very they're not very good 12 beacon 12 beacon builds. So I'm very heavily focusing on the. Uh, eight beacon builds for mainly for most of my designs 
I'm focusing on making sure that we have full inbound belts and full outbound belts for all the designs whenever possible, because that makes it so much more efficient. And that's how I would propose to design it. Basically, when you make a design such as this one, you design it so that you have at least eight beacons on on each of each of your production locations. You make sure that the inbounds will always be full and your outputs will be full. So that this each one of these rows is producing exactly saturating, fully saturating one belt. So you'll never have a partial belt here as long as you have oh, science. Yay. And uh, and and that's a, that makes it very efficient and you can scale it very big with this way. Productivity modules, I don't think I I mean it feel it goes without saying, but I think still think it's it's important. Did I just say inputs and outputs? It's of course inputs and outputs. There we go. Uh, productivity modules are incredibly important because basically it's free stuff. You get 20% free stuff with this one. And otherwise you'd have to have 20% more entities here. And that's uh, that's more entities. So you get more stuff without actually building more entities. That's super, super efficient. Yeah. So, and if you can't have a build like this, like low quantity builds such as these, then robots are way more efficient. And then of course you use trains to transport between longer distances. Now, one of the things that I've gotten like a million questions about in this space is my mining operation, because you can see these kind of mining operations here, the, the classic one, tons of miners, uh, tons of belts. And as they are being drawn from here, they'll all be partially filled as we saw earlier. Uh, super inefficient for build management. So what I'm doing in this space is I'm doing direct mining into, let's see if we can find a good direct miner. Uh, do we have anything here? Yes, here's a good direct mining input. Oh, perfect, there's another train coming in. There you go. So each of these, they're now working at speed 3.25. That's a plus 550 uh, additional speed. They fill up this train pretty quickly actually. And and the way I'm, I'm doing this is I'm setting this one up, lots of beacons, lots of modules. When they expand on one side, I can flip them over. I can basically take this thing and then turn it around up here and then turn the whole thing and then they'll start consuming more of it. I'm not using the whole belt, but that I don't really care about it. What I do care about is making sure that the amount of this will, uh, the amount of materials is is a reasonable amount. So what I've done is I've calculated this in this specific case. How much do I need of the different products in each of these locations and made sure that if I have trains going in here, they will be able to support it. The disadvantages, of course, and this is what you can see here, you can see as they are partially filled, you will have some trains coming in. Let's see if we can find some of those trains. Uh, no, these are also perfect. Uh, let's see if we can find something that's not perfect. Oh, should be possible. Yeah, this one. So as they start consuming things on the outside, then they won't be able to fill them up. That's of course a, that's unfortunate. And as you grow out, as your mining productivity increases, then each patch will last longer time. And on top of that, and you will go further out and tap bigger patches. This is one of the reasons, or this is actually the main reason why I'm using one four trains and not two eight trains in this basis, because I don't have big enough or patches to put two eight trains. So if you really want to build a, a mega base, then my suggestion would be make sure that during your terrain generation, the game generation, you build absolutely gigantic patches, fewer patches, but absolutely gigantic, both in saturation, in richness and in in size, because then you can park a 2A train on top of it and you can mine the whole 2A train and it'll go up. It is the best way because look, comparing the number of entities here, this one has four, uh, eight entities, eight miners to one train. And of course you would have then have, in each case, I have two trains waiting so that there's there should, if it's using at peak capacity, there should always be one, uh, one here. But because our mining productivity is so high, they're actually, easily able to keep up. So that is one of the best tricks I would give to anyone who wants to build big. You must do, ah, must, well, yeah, actually, truly, you must do direct mining. It's so many entities you save this way. It does give a, a lot of other constraints, like like the management of as they run out, well, how are you going to transition? And uh, also it just puts a requirement. There are simply some patches that are too small to actually tap this way, and there are and, and that's just the way it is.
Uh, you can also do stuff like this. As you've cleaned out the majority, then you just put uh, robots and miners here on everything just to clean out the rest. That's something you can do, and I'm also doing it here. So just, I just want to clean out the rest, 400, 500,000, then it just gives us more space. I don't like paving over mines, but that's just a, that's just me. So basically there you have some really good options. Limit the number of entities and the number of belts. Use trains as much as possible. Robots are fine, full belts are fine. But uh, again, anything you do, if you go overboard, if you just decide that, okay, I'm just gonna tap this a whole thing with 20,000 robots, well, you might be doing yourself a disservice when the alternative could be, I don't know, 20, uh, 30, 40 entities instead of having 20,000 robots. So I don't count beacons as active ones because they, they don't do anything. They don't continue calculate. They are just there. Um, so that's that's really some of the main parts. A, an absolutely giant one is switching to solar panels and killing all the biters as well. It will also free up a lot of things. So tons of good ideas in order for you to build a base. And that's how I design my base. So sometimes I'll get questions like, why have I split things out like this? Well, I've done that because then I can utilize the fact that robots are here. It's not robots over a giant area because they, they are separate, small robotic areas. So that's really easy for the robots to fly back and forth and it works very well this is why i can run a 3000 science per minute base at 60 uh, updates and still have actually honestly quite a lot of room to spare now that we killed the biters and i could certainly from an update perspective maybe not from a design perspective from an update perspective i could easily make this into i would say four and a half thousand not easily but i could make it into four and a half thousand not pretty sure that I couldn't do it from a, a design perspective, but I could uh, from an update perspective, which I think is really nice uh, that you're not going to be constrained by the updates. So that's going to be the end of uh, this quite meta oriented and also honestly quite long session. I felt that I had to go into detail with this because the people are interested in it, don't want a, a high level thing. They want to go into the details of it and really understand why are the things that the way they are. For if you are not building mega bases, well, maybe now you understand why sometimes I do things that seem logical, like not using a lot of circuit networks, trying to save on those, um, making the direct mining, for example, making these small locations with with robots served. You know, I, I why I'm using so absurdly many solar panels instead of just building better nuclear power plants. There are a lot of things that I do design wise that that actually has a reason, believe it or not. So thank you very much for watching. And if you want to just watch more, then know that I'm always streaming, or I'm always releasing factorial content here on YouTube, a weekly masterclass, and of course, always a Let's Play. And so if you have not subscribed to the channel, I think this might be a good time for you to do that since you've been sitting through this very technical and meta-oriented, and clearly you must be a, an avid viewer of the channel. Then also, of course, if you want to yell at me in real time, then over on Twitch, it's at twitch.tv slash Nilaus, and I'm streaming six days a week at 8 p.m. Central European time. And it would be awesome to you to drop by. No, it would be awesome for me if you would drop by. I love uh, having people coming over from YouTube and hang out. And actually, a lot of people uh, find the live stream format more enjoyable to follow. So thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you either here on YouTube, over on the Discord server, or on, on Twitch. Thank you for watching, and as always, stay effective.